impact on the open source initiatives. Uh, I'm going to kick off the mini summit uh, by giving you the uh, flavor of what we are doing at the board level, uh, the SODA, ESODA Foundation. And then we'll actually jump into more technical details. Uh, the draw cage from IBM is going to cover the SODA uh, from a use case and a higher level framework perspective. And then we have Sanil uh, from Huawei. He is going to cover the, the architecture click down. Uh, and then we'll essentially get into the member projects. Yusuf from Blendbed is going to cover the Lint store. And then we have Kiran from Maya Data, who is going to cover the open EBS. And then we have Stefano from Scality, who is going to cover the Zenko. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with Larry from Huawei covering the Soda outreach community. And then we'll do the Q&A towards end. Hopefully, we'll have enough time for a Q&A. Um, uh, currently, we are planning around 10 minutes or so. Do post your questions while we are presenting, and we'll consolidate that and do the Q&A towards the end. Uh, with that, let's go to the next slide. Do I need to click on this slide? or? OK, perfect. Um, let's go to the next one. One more. All right, OK. Um, so the little bit of background on the Soda Foundation, uh, which is really part of the Linux uh, Foundation, uh, we used to we started this effort back in 2016. Uh, it is essentially a combination of few storage vendors getting together, uh, plus Intel on my side, uh, to really figure out what is the best way to consolidate uh, the integration touch points in the for the storage control plane. Uh, we were primarily looking for um, you know, what is the best way for us to, um, you know, create a control plane that works across different orchestration stacks. This includes the commercial um, orchestration stacks like VMware, Microsoft, and so on, as well as the open source flavors, including OpenStack and Kubernetes, which are essentially virtualized uh, container uh, abstraction layers. Um, and we wanted to essentially look at what is the best way to create one common control plane to uniform different uh, orchestration stacks. And then uh, if you look at what happened in 2016, most of our focus has been you know, with uh, consolidating the orchestration layer. Uh, Kubernetes was fairly in the beginning. Uh, there was a lot of discussion going on on the Kubernetes uh, container storage you know, interfaces, what is the best way to abstract it out. But over the course of time, what happened was, um, you know, the rather than focusing on just an integration touch point for the orchestration stack, the the whole ecosystem around storage has changed quite a bit um, from 2016 onwards, and more and more data is essentially anchored towards um, AI type of workloads, um, and there has been a lot of focus on the edge, autonomous driving. Um, so the the community focus has evolved from let's actually create a common control plane for different orchestration stacks to let's create a common data plane uh, that really addresses the you know the emerging workloads that are really around uh, data uh, centric workloads um, let's go to the next slide Uh, the Soda Foundation is, uh, you know, uh, essentially a direct, uh, directed fund project in the Linux Foundation, um, where the funding comes from premium members and general members. Uh, we have folks from China, uh, Unicorn and Fujitsu, Huawei, NTT, Toyota being the premier members, and then there are several general members as well. There are a few folks, you know, uh, who are going to present: Scality, Linbit, Maya Data. Being the you know the focused member projects today, um, so the goal of Soda Foundation is to essentially create an open source uh, data uh, and storage control plane orchestration where we can actually bring in different projects out there that can actually you know um, be part of the foundation uh, through the common you know the abstraction layer. Let's go to the next one. Okay, um, what you see today is what is the rationale behind on the Soda project? Um, when we looked at 
you know, very early on, our rationale was mostly control plane, you know, consolidation. Then as we started looking at the workloads, uh, we had different set of problems that we wanted to really address, and there was no one common framework that can actually do this. Um, so lots of implementations out there where you have siloed uh, data management you know, uh, implementations um, with different types of interfaces. They're not uniform, um, mostly manual, uh, and it's not easy to actually integrate them. So there has been a lot of focus around what is the best way to interrupt these discrete point siloed solutions, and what is the best way to create that using the uniform framework. Uh, that was really the reasoning behind, um, you know, um, kicking off a SODA Foundation project. So it's really anchored towards a streamlined uh, data, um, you know, orchestration platform. Next slide. Okay, um, if you look at left-hand side, um, the data management, um, you can actually bring in a different uh, data management you know, project into, under the umbrella of SODA. And our goal is to not actually do everything organically within the SODA Foundation project, but rather bring in the existing open source initiatives uh, as well as the commercial initiatives under the umbrella of one unified data management framework. Um, that's really the, the intent of you know, having the uh, SODA uh, foundation. Uh, the way we see it is you know, for the foundation is going to look at this from a framework for perspective, but you know, the intent is you need to be able to move the data um, on-prem and cloud. Um, you need to be able to take advantage of the standard interfaces. Uh, there should be an interoperability focus as well. Um, and then we need to be able to deliver um, a scale and then be able to take advantage of the solutions, rapid um, you know, time to market solutions. Um, that's the underpinning of you know, what we are trying to you know, achieve out of this sort of uh, foundation focus. Okay, um, I won't go into the details of the framework. Um, you know, we have a couple of talks, um, you know, for this one. Um, you know, if you look at the highest level on the right-hand side, uh, focus is it has to be open source, whether it is data management related, storage management related, we want to be able to deliver an open source uh, framework. Uh, it has to be standardized so that it's easy to plug in uh, different, you know, uh, vertical uh, point solutions easily, and we need to be able to deliver that you know, via the ecosystem partnerships, both on the hardware platforms um, as well as the software, be able to stitch them together to build solutions for different use cases. It could be AI, it could be edge, it could be on-prem, it could be, you know, be able to move the data back and forth between public and private, uh, and so on. And then, you know, over the course of time, we would like to actually get into the certification aspect as well. So as a user that is consuming the solution, you know exactly, um, you know, the, the quality and the, the stability you should be expecting based on the certification process. Next slide. Here are the different programs. Um, our goal is to uh, bring in and support the incubation aspect. So if you have a project that you really want to be able to uh, incubate, um, get the early you know, uh, support going on, uh, something that is related to data and storage related projects, uh, we do that through the sort of incubation program. Um, the, for the developer ecosystem, we have boot camps uh, for vendors. You know, we will be able to support vendor ecosystem through Soda Foundry. And then obviously, you know, the users will be able to use the lab infrastructure to be able to, you know, do certain POCs and get familiar with the uh, sort of framework and the solution that they are actually looking at. And then obviously the community uh, has a way to, uh, you know, reach out to any support that you need. And then obviously we look at events as a way to, uh, you know, broaden the uh, visibility of what SODA can actually do and how it can help. Uh, to address the end user pain points. Next slide. 
I'll spend a couple of minutes on the governance, uh, just to give you a flavor of how we are managing the governance in the SODA. Uh, next slide. Um, at the top level, we have the board. Um, as you can imagine, the board focus is really to manage the budget, uh, manage the, you know, look at the allocation of the money for different types of work, whether it is the development, uh, whether it is the outreach, or whether it is POCs and customer solutions or event. Um, that's really the part and parcel of you know the governing board, uh, for, you know the responsibility. And then we have a technical steering committee, and there are different working groups focusing on the different aspects of the technical. Um, you know, domains. Um, it could be architecture, it could be use cases, and, and it could be POCs. Uh, that is part and parcel of the technical steering committee scope. Uh, Rakesh is going to cover that. Um, and then we have end user advisory committee. This is something that we wanted to consciously promote, primarily from um, the perspective of understanding the use cases and the pain points and how do we actually address that uh, methodically uh, via well-defined standard interfaces and then developing a framework that uh, really will evolve into addressing the solutions and pain points as opposed to a technical uh, view. And then outreach community to really broaden the, um, the usage aspect as well as uh, the raising the awareness in the, uh, in the industry. So that's really in the nutshell what the governance is, uh, starting with the board, technical steering committee, and user focus and outreach focus. Next slide. Uh, here are the members from different companies. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the members are from most of the big companies that you might have come across. Uh, and our goal is to actually expand this based on over the course of time with more broader representatives. Um, and we'll continue to work on that one. Next slide. Next one. All right. Um, I will uh, hand it over to Rakesh. Uh, Rakesh is going to cover the um, technical steering committee uh, aspect as well as the few of the projects that are actually in flight currently. Uh, that will give you a flavor of what's happening uh, at a technical level. Rakesh. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Reddy. All right. So actually, I'm actually going to talk about not so much about PSC right now, but um, I'll talk about the SODA projects, uh, the use cases uh, where SODA can be used, and the SODA roadmap. Uh, before I start, something about me. I work for IBM Research uh, in San Jose and uh, involved with this project. Uh, uh, the predecessor of this project is OpenSDS, which has to do with same storage management. And, uh, now we are getting into the data management aspect as well. So um, part of the uh, TSC and the board member as well for this project. <clears throat> so yeah, let's start with the SODA projects first. The, you know, we have to have the architecture diagram. So this is how the architecture of SODA looks like. Uh, I won't go into the details of this right now, but uh, Sanil is going to cover more details uh, of the architecture itself. But uh, what I want to mention here is that um, all these boxes you see here, these are actually uh, in the middle. These are actually independent or projects which make up the SODA uh, framework. So, so that's what we call SODA projects. But that's not just it. So, so uh, just to explain it a little bit, you know, Soda Foundation basically is a is a foundation where multiple projects are hosted, right? And it's not like uh, other foundations where where the similar thing happens. But our goal here is to offer something which. This kind of a product, an open source product, you can install and use. So that's the whole idea you know, uh, about how we actually integrate different projects in Soda Foundation, which are uh, more or less you know, into the storage and data management. So that's 
the whole thing. So there are um, there are multiple types of projects we can say, or you can call it categories of projects. Uh, first is the core projects. That's basically how it makes the software as a working thing. Right? So that's the very core of it. Uh, in that we have this multiple uh, projects like API, uh, controller, multi-cloud, telemetry, dark, and so on, right? So this basically makes the core. You have to have this for Soda as an installable working product, right? On top of that, so this is the work, you know, the base Soda community does. These are originated in Soda. These are maintained by Soda, and they make up the, the the release part of the release cycle, right? Then there is a set of projects which get donated to Soda Foundation. Uh, for example, uh, Yig from China Unicorn. Uh, you're going to listen about Lin Store today and Zenko. So these are basically, even though this started separately um, and they have their own release cycle, uh, but they are actually donated to Soda Foundation and they are part of the Soda Foundation. So they are considered as member projects. There are some other projects like eco projects and uh, ecosystem projects and others, which we are still working on. So that's you know high level what we have for the projects. All right. <clears throat> so next thing uh, I want to go into the use cases. Okay. So what are you going to do with so? All right. So <clears throat> uh, there are few use cases I will cover. Uh, there is actually a broad range of them, but I will cover you know high level what we are working on. So as Reddy mentioned, we have um, end user advisory committee, right? So that's actually the source for us to get the requirements. That tell us, you know, what are the pain points? What do we want, you know, as a end user? So, so that is actually our uh, source of requirements. For example, this use case, is for cloud native storage. It's uh, coming from KPN, Yahoo Japan, China, China Construction Bank, and so on. Right? So, and this use case applies to a lot of companies. These are our end user com uh, community companies. So, what is the use case here? Basically, you know, you have heterogeneous storage systems and devices. And you want to provision storage for Kubernetes, right? Now, the problem with that is that you don't get the unified view of the storage. Now, what Soda has, uh, continuing on that, Soda has its own CSI driver. Soda doesn't have any storage of its own. It's a CSI driver. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, Soda actually interacts with a lot of other storage systems uh, through Cinder or Manila or you know Swordfish based APIs um, and some of them directly like so. As well as you know, uh, there is a new work stream going on that it can interact with the CSI drivers of those devices as well but you know the advantage here is that once you have soda in your system in your framework in your infrastructure you get access or ability to provision store to all these different devices that's the main idea here and why because um, let, let's first talk about the csi thing right so you get to provision storage for your Kubernetes environment. Then we have this something called Soda Multi-Cloud, where you, you can uh, 
connect to different clouds to basically object store uh, to put your data in. Now, what Sora CSI uh, and its orchestration does is that you can actually take snapshot directly into any of the clouds you want, right? So this is a cool feature you get irrespective of what storage device you use, right? On top of that, um, you know, it's just Kubernetes, but yeah, um, so does supports OpenStack as well. Uh, the work for VMware is uh, is in the plan, not yet started. But so, so what we call is not bound, we have Kubernetes, OpenStack, and so on, especially the open uh, source ones. Southbound, we have all different devices. And then we have the multi cloud. On top of that, there is telemetry and intelligence and all that. Um, that is a separate set of projects which are going on. So this is basically the core idea for that particular use case. And you know, basically the main thing here is that you get a unified view and uh, one interface to deal with. Okay, next uh, use case is about data lifecycle. So this is coming from our another use another end user, uh, Toyota, and uh, this is an interesting use case. They have tons of data coming from their cars, as as from edge devices, and you know IoT data. It's it has uh, a high value when it is uh, uh, fresh. As it gets little, little, little older, the, the, the value goes down. And so what they want to do here is that they want to actually keep the data in different types of storage based on the age of the data. As it gets older, it gets moved to uh, secondary storage or to another storage, right? Uh, or archive it for compliance reasons and whatnot. So that's the whole idea here, that uh, this is where we get into the data life cycle. Uh, the solution here basically is that using the policy, you can manage how you want to uh, transfer data to different storage devices or different types of storage. All right, so that's the data lifecycle use case. Then there is another use case uh, coming from China Unicom. And this is about the data lake. Um, this has to do with, uh, with the project. I think uh, there was another talk about this. Uh, this project is from China Unicom called YIG. Uh, this is a collaboration between YIG and uh, Soda, multi-cloud uh, so basically you know that the use case here is that i want to have a data lake i will dump all kinds of data here for doing all kinds of analysis whether it is uh, reporting or whether it is uh, machine learning or MapReduce kind of job whatever right so <laughs> this is actually an interesting project and uh, as you know, YIG has become part of the sort of function, and uh, uh, we are working actually very closely with them on this particular business. All right, so this one uh, I, I touched upon a little bit the multi cloud coming from entity, and I think uh, uh, so. This is uh, simple, right? You want to store your data in different clouds. You know, we had a problem with the storage heterogeneity in the past. Now we have a problem with the cloud heterogeneity. So this is the one which addresses that. And I think we will talk about uh, Zenco uh, later on. Stefano will talk about it. So he will cover more details on how the multi-cloud control, controller and all that 
is going to work. All right, so those were some use cases, not all of those. And uh, there are more creative ways we know people will come up with uh, when they use Zoom. So what is the plan for 2020? Uh, as you know, we just announced the Soda Foundation uh, earlier this week. Uh, there are a bunch of companies, in fact, this is not a complete list, uh, who have joined the foundation. Uh, in terms of collaboration, we are working closely with uh, CNCF and other uh, open source uh, as well as industry partners. In fact, uh, Open EBS is the one uh, Kiran is going to talk today as well. Uh, it's about the, the, the container storage as well as Linwood, Yusuf will talk about. So, um development is continuing we started with open sdas and it is going on uh, we moved everything to now soda uh, but uh, yes yeah, anil will talk about more about that it's leading the development part um, and then we do actually a lot of uh, uh, meetups and forums and uh, events and like this one we actually used to go to different conferences, but now we do virtual. So that's uh, that's whole uh, what SODA is. In fact, uh, when the like, other open source projects join SODA Foundation, they actually get quite a bit of benefit um, because this is a combined effort. A lot of our other projects are there and you get uh, publicity as part of the, the, the foundation. So that's uh, all I had. Uh, I think we'll do question and answers in the end. And I will hand over to Sani for the next one. Yeah, thanks, uh, Reddy and Rakesh. <clears throat> okay, so we have seen uh, the introduction uh, vision and also a glimpse about the project uh, also use cases and uh, uh, high level roadmap for us in 2020 so basically for any open source projects uh, uh, the project ecosystem is very important and the architecture okay before we go into the, the details of this my session uh, good afternoon if you're in cdg timeline or good morning or good evening uh, uh, here it's just 1 a.m in the night uh, so thanks for joining us so we'll see in this session mainly about the projects and the architecture and probably if you uh, some of the developers are there in the audience i think you can get to know how to join and contribute and myself, Sanil, uh, I work uh, as a DSC member and uh, driving the architecture work group. So you can find me in Slack uh, uh, anytime. I think that's the place uh, where we work. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, maybe. Thank you. So as Reddy and uh, Rakesh uh, mentioned, this is an overall uh, framework architecture. We will bore you with this architecture diagram in most of the sessions. Uh, so just to add to Rakesh and uh, uh, Reddy, what they mentioned uh, is that, say, this is unified. Uh, because if you see uh, Soda anywhere, we say that one data network and infinite possibilities. Uh, that's our dream. So how, f uh, how far we have traveled for that dream, we can see some of the projects uh, in the session. So basically, we want to have unified and uh, open standardization. And two more key aspects. Uh, if you see on the north side, uh, you can see most of the application platforms. And on the south side, if you see, there are storages. So the key aspect is that we want to make application platform agnostic. So basically, we say in our style that any platform. And on the south side, we want to make it vendor neutral. 
that means we want to support any storage. So that is when we say that any platform, any storage we support. And that's why we call it as it's a single data network. Uh, why data network? If you see OpenSDS uh, in the past, you might have seen data management. But we have removed that management. In fact, we have not removed management. We have added some more things to management. So we support management and also the data plane. So our vision now refined to uh, grab more scope based on our inputs from our end users committee. So we support control plane as well as data plane. Okay. So this framework provides a high level view that how Soda framework is envisioning to solve those uh, data silos and provide a unified framework. You can see different layers here. And this we want to support edge, core, and cloud. Core, when I say core, it's on-prem. So on-prem cloud is very common and edge is coming up. So we want to support this unified framework even in the edge. So let us see how the core projects uh, like Rakesh mentioned, the core projects are the projects maintained by us, developed by us for some of the key features. So we see some of the core projects uh, in this and the overall architecture, how we are shaping up uh, this direction. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So this slide uh, shows about some of the key focus areas uh, like data mobility, heterogeneous storage, data energy and cloud native storage, uh, this kind of, uh, so basically there are different focus areas. Why focus area? We've just wanted to explore that what are the collaborations possible? What are the projects in that area possible? Uh, should we unify these focus areas under one project or multiple projects? Can we have ecosystem projects from our partners to solve these problems? Because our idea is to probably bring a unified framework rather than building everything from scratch. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, sorry, once again, <laughs> the architecture diagram. Don't worry, actually all my slides till the end, uh, this architecture diagrams will keep coming, okay. Uh, okay, so just, just to, uh, before we go to this particular simplistic uh, diagram, I just want to say that uh, in the architecture, okay, maybe we'll come back to that. So let's see a very, very simple uh, view of the overall architecture. If you see this view, on the top, you can see application platforms, and then you see Soda framework and the storage. That's what Rakesh was trying to explain with the different use cases. So basically, in a simplistic sense, we just connect from the application platforms to the storage where the data belongs to. Now. If you have different platforms, if you have different storages, it can be the storages in the edge, storages can be on-prem, different storages like a different vendor storage, and also it can be a multi-cloud storage backends. And when you say platform, you have already seen in the higher uh, framework diagram that uh, it can be big data, it can be uh, Kubernetes, it can be OpenStack, VMware, and so on and so forth. So now, if you, today if you see, the key issue is that now Kubernetes, if you see, Kubernetes has got some specific way to connect to the storage. OpenStack, it has got its own way. VMware has its own way. That's where Soda Framework will become handy in one aspect, that we connect them irrespective of the platform to irrespective of the southbound storages. On top of it, Rakesh was trying to say different features like data mobility, data management, data lifecycle, data protection, all that we want to provide those key features for data inside this unified framework. So the application framework can focus on the application business logic and the storage can simply focus on the storage. So we connect between and provide a unified interface. When you say unified interface, we are moving in the direction of uh, some standardization, collaborating with our partners and standard organizations. So this is a simplistic view. Now, uh, we can go to the next slide. Now, if you want to see what work we are doing, uh, you can just go to github.com slash Soda Foundation. We have multiple projects there. Uh, so you will see 
API controller doc MBP MBP is nothing but northbound uh, plugin uh, we will have we will see the details and multi cloud and a new project introduced which is called delphin if you go to soda foundation github you will see delphin uh, that is soda infrastructure manager we'll talk about it and there are other projects like installer documentation examples and also some of the experimental projects like orchestration and anomaly detection. So we will see how these projects, uh, uh, what, how this means to the overall architecture and how these projects are positioned. So when you go to GitHub, if you see the project, you will be able to connect that project, how it fits into our overall architecture. So let's see a slightly complex view but we will try to discuss in a simple way. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so it looks complex, but it is not. Uh, so if you see the blue shaded part, that is our set of key core uh, projects. So you can see on the top, uh, in that blue shaded area, northbound plugins. And then you have API, and then controller, and below that, dock. And on the left hand side, you can see Soda Infrastructure Manager. On the right hand side, you can see multi cloud. So if you go to GitHub, you will clearly see NBP as a project that is northbound plugin. Then you will find API as a separate project. You will see controller as a project doc as a project sim is soda infrastructure manager you will see it as a delphin delphin is nothing but dolphin in spanish thanks for the community for suggestion of that name uh, we are actually uh, you may feel that this api controller and all boring names so we are in the process of changing the names to some interesting names like delphin uh, so on the bottom you can see the storages so I just put it in two boxes. One is on-prem or edge kind of native storages. And on the right hand side, you can see the cloud storages. The top most part, you can see application platforms and also a dashboard, which is in a different color. Dashboard also, you can see it as a separate project under GitHub because this dashboard is our client to provide the complete experience of all our core projects of Soda. So when you have a Soda release, basically you experience all the projects through this dashboard. Okay, on the left hand side, you see a big vertical uh, box, though it is a small project, it's installer. Uh, so installer and dashboard are the two projects which will get you an integrated view of all the Soda projects currently. So if you go to our latest release, Basically, you are going to install all the projects which are configured through the installer. And once it is successfully installed, you are going to experience in the uh, dashboard. Okay. So we have a, a demo, I mean, live demo on the cloud of based on our latest release. Probably we'll share that link at the end of the session. Then you can see on the left hand side again, there are some examples, documentation, documentation is overall documentation it is docs.sodafoundation.io all the documentations are available there and examples uh, are like use cases because last release we have provided a use case for streaming using our multi cloud these are all experiment use cases to try out that how our projects can connect together and give a particular use case solutions and then you will see anomaly detection and orchestration so this anomaly detection and orchestration, we will talk a little later. Now we come back to the main uh, portion. So now we talked about, we will spend some time in this slide so that the subsequent slides, again, I'm going to bore you with all the architecture diagram with the different project information, okay? So now uh, we'll spend some time to understand here and then we can go faster in those slides. So here uh, you see that application platforms. now. Example application platform, say it is Kubernetes, it can be OpenStack, it can be VMware. These are three platforms which we are already supporting. Now, 
if kubernetes has to support has to be supported with soda what does that mean it means that kubernetes can connect to our southbound all the storages supported in the soda foundation projects so that's the meaning right so how do we connect so you know that kubernetes connects to the storage through csi so container storage interface it uses now it can connect to any storages with specific csi drivers so we also have a soda csi driver the speciality of is that this single csi driver or plugin can connect to all the soda supported storages on the south side so that's the beauty of it now we how do we connect because we connect through our unified api in the block if you see api api provides a unified api for data management now csi doesn't understand this now what we do so we need a connector unless these people that's our dream that all these platforms tomorrow when soda has an api standard all these platforms will come back and comply to these api standards then these plugins are not required because it can directly work our dashboard directly works because it uses soda api uh, but till then we cannot say that kubernetes is not supported or openstack doesn't support right so nobody will use this platform so now we have a mode to connect a simple way to connect that we write plugins to connect kubernetes a plugin to connect openstack a plugin to connect vmware tomorrow if you want openshift or any other platforms you just need to write the plugin as soon as you have the plugin to connect to soda foundation a soda core then all the supported storages will be available because you don't need to worry about the storage interfaces now th that's a way the northbound plugin helps to connect any platform so we already have kubernetes plugin that is soda csi plugin then openstack cinder and for vmware ngc uh, type of plugins are available and we are adding more and more uh, plugins to connect now connect to what the api layer so what we are trying to do is that if you see api controller doc and mpp this gives you a heterogeneous storage and platform connectivity on premise because these are currently supporting file and block storages so you can have file operations and block storage block operations onto the on prem heterogeneous storages through this interface so api api will provide you a standard interface a consolidated unified api interface controller is just a bookkeeping so local uh, database and metadata those kind of management will be happening in the controller and doc is another very very important project wherein we can connect any vendor storage driver plugged now similar uh, uh, mode like how we connect application to the api we connect an adapter layer driver for any of the storage vendors say for example you have netapp or emc or any other storages you can connect to the dock with a very small thin layer so we should you uh, a week time or something like that you can just develop and deploy and it connect so as soon as you connect these storages the dock is enriched with all the supported storage drivers so we already support ibm netapp fujitsu huawei lvm ceph those kind of interfaces we already support in dock so that that is where the drivers are connected now we come back to the soda infrastructure manager this is a very important project we newly released in the latest release our latest release is the major release 1.0 called ferro we just released along with our launch so this project is introduced in that release this soda infrastructure manager what does it do so basically if you if you want to manage the storage just directly at the disk level you need more control so you want to you need to have the control at the pool level okay so earlier we we used to have the api controller doc in that a, uh, line we used to support at volume level the volume is the input now if you want to manage uh, your storage you want to increase the storage decrease the storage or you want to check the io all those things you can 
do through this resource management. So we integrated resource management into this unified framework. So it can support heterogeneous. That's the beauty of it. Any storage behind which is supported in the dock can automatically support uh, with this interface for resource management. Not only resource management, we support the alarms, notifications, and also the monitoring, the telemetry performance data using this interface. So now you get the notifications, you get the telemetry data, and also you can manage the storages directly from this framework that to heterogeneous storages. Now this telemetry data is very important for any of the application framework because you need to analyze your storages, the health, and so on and so forth, how it is performing, and whether any errors are there, do I need to take an action? Those kind of stuff can be derived from this interface. And we provide a scalable interface called uh, to exporters so that you can write using exporter interface, exporter for, say, Prometheus. You can write. Or you want to write an exporter for Kafka, you can write. So as soon as I say Kafka, then you can easily connect to anomaly detection. Now, if you write an exporter for Kafka, and it can easily connect to anomaly detection. So anomaly detection is an experimental project from our side to prove that we can connect these things, and you can do some prediction. So as of now, anomaly detection is a very small project. We have only one algorithm called based on DB scan, and the algorithms can be plug and play. If you're interested in anomaly detection or further uh, AIML kind of stuff, you're welcome to contribute to this project. And one project is missing so far is orchestration. Uh, as you know, in storages, each workflow uh, will be having a set of operations a various set of operations and each services the operations will be keep changing now how do you manage the situation so we thought that we can provide an orchestration uh, automation and orchestration framework wherein you can do the workflow automation you don't confuse this with the data orchestration this is like a workflow orchestration you can do with this project uh, so this is also an experimental project you can have custom uh, workflows and things like that you can experience through our dashboard so if you go to ferro release uh, take the latest uh, release and you can experience all the projects which we have just discussed here okay so maybe we can move uh, to the next slide actually the session is almost covered <laughs> okay so this this just a notes about some of the projects which i have already mentioned that some are core projects some are uh, projects which are helping to experience and some are uh, just uh, uh, the documentation or use cases and kind of stuff. Just a note to understand better. We can go to the next slide. So the further slides, each slide, uh, that's what I, I keep my word that every slide I will bore you with the architecture diagram. So every slide has uh, each project short information and what we support currently and what we are planning to do. So probably the notes you can just skip because all the information, if you go to the specific project, you have a readme and you, we have a repository called design spec. You can get most of the information there uh, or docs.foundation.io you can get. And in case you are not getting, please ping us in Slack. So the api right now we support file and block and in the latest release we have already released a api specification draft which support file block on-prem multi-cloud i will talk about it later and then soda infrastructure manager interface so three types of uh, api specification we have already released in the current one and our idea is to unify this take this api uh, project into a standard api specification project for across the board that's our vision we can go to the next slide so this is controller uh, mo uh, mostly this uses uh, uh, local database and metadata management so i'll skip the slide uh, yeah we can go to the next slide because we already have discussed so only some key points i'll touch upon the doc see right now uh, we support uh, netapp uh, IBM, uh, Fujitsu, Huawei storages, LVM, Ceph, because as soon as you support Ceph, I think there are so many other Ceph-supported storages you can use. 
so there are variety of storages supported on the south side as of now through dock but our wish vision is to have any storage vendor driver to be supported here so we welcome any of the vendors or interested people to write drivers for the existing storage models so we can exponentially support all the storages for any platform so we can go to the next slide please so this is northbound plugin which we have already discussed so right now we have kubernetes openstack and vmware uh, and we plan to support more plugins for vmware because as you know vmware needs different different plugins for different operations uh, so we are trying to support more and more there uh, and also we are trying to do i mean overall just one more input rakesh also mentioned about it that the csi driver we are just exploring that whether we can support the csi driver as in plug and play so if we can plug and play the csi driver because as you know most of the vendors because kubernetes is the the, the platform today uh, uh moving towards cloud so uh, uh most of the vendors they have csi driver so if we can support csi plug and play then exponentially we can increase the support of storage backends uh, in our platform so we are just exploring uh, it's not very easy very tricky so we have some prototype working now so we just mentioned in the release uh, so we are working on that if anybody is interested in csi uh, kubernetes uh, expertise if you have please contact us in slack i think we need your help yeah we can go to the next slide please okay so this is soda infrastructure manager this is one of the key projects which we are uh, 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 trying to put a lot of focus on uh, uh, because this can give a lot of storage level information to the application uh, framework which is currently scattered and fragmented uh, especially across the storage any vendor solutions if you see they will support their storage management but here we can support heterogeneous because already the framework support that so we can exploit that feature and provide uh, the resource management alarm and telemetry and the telemetry is one of the uh, i think important aspects uh, to do prediction and uh, better management of the storage so we can go to the next one and one more just one more point is that these uh, as we just discussed there are different projects uh, we discussed in this and there is no language barrier because if you know go uh, python java uh, as of now python java scripting javascript uh, web technology you have any of this expertise we welcome because we have lot of projects in different different languages and our architecture is based on microservice so we are not really language bound uh, so coming to the contribution side uh, uh, we welcome uh, the contributions because we are building our community we are working with students and different community members to enable them uh, as uh, rakesh mentioned and uh, already mentioned about boot camp so we also have a mentoring program which is called soda boot camp we have already kick started so if you are interested please contact us and straight away if you want to contribute you can just go to the github you see just start searching for start my contribution or smc uh, label or help needed label you can start contra i mean contributing or you can simply test and raise issues or if you go to docs dot it's a secret don't i mean quote me docs dot soda foundation dot io if you go there are a lot of issues because we are just migrated from open sds to soda foundation so you can find issues you can help us to improve the documentation uh, so these are the some of the ways you can directly contribute to the engineering side of it at the same time every time uh, for a year uh, we do quarterly release and we have the roadmap uh, roadmap already available public in the release repo so you can see that if you are interested to suggest any new features please feel free to do that and the best place to do that is slack uh, either slack or you can do bitly soda global community meeting if you go there we have a bi weekly meeting you can join us and uh, give us your suggestions uh, we will definitely consider that in our roadmap so this is about most of the core projects and how you can contribute to co core projects now we will listen to the echo and native projects uh, from yusuf stefano and kiran
thank you for listening thank you sanil for this detailed architecture of the project and it has been a pleasure to work with you on soda as always hello everyone uh, my name is Yusuf, uh, and I work as a solution architect at Linbit, uh, the company behind the DRBD and Linstore. And um, Linbit is a software company that has devoted its last 20 years to block disk replication. And Linstore is the software that this company has developed in recent years to provide disk replication and automation. In my session, I will give you some detailed information about Linstore, and then its architecture, and then I will explain uh, why we contribute, why we choose to contribute Linstore to Soda Foundation. Okay, so Linstore is uh, basically an orchestrator for Linux building blocks, including the RBD itself. And you can easily provision, migrate, delete volumes within LinStore with some simple commands and with the help of the great API. And LinStore main focus is um, SDS customers, like let's say cloud native orchestrators, which can be Kubernetes, OpenStack, Open Nebula, etc. And but it is also used on bare metal storage solutions or maybe hyper-converged infrastructures, big ecosystems like, let's say, Intel's RST and etc. And in LinStore, uh, you can have multiple tenants. Or th these are possible. Uh, different scenarios are possible. You can easily deploy uh, new nodes into the system, also decommission the older nodes from the system easily. Uh, we have a product called the RBD, actually, and this is the core product Linbit uh, developed. And I bet you know or you know it already. Um, and you don't need to use the RBD with LinStore. It's not mandatory, but if you use it, it will come with a, a replication, block replication on the kernel level. Uh, but the LinStore can also use LVM, TIN LVM, ZFS, and these kind of you know, volume management systems uh, natively. And it would be bad if I don't mention, and it's open source project, like everything we do on the GPL, of course. Here is, I'm showing you the LinStore architecture. And um, LinStore has two parts, satellite and the controller. So the satellite is responsible for disk management, creating disks, deleting disks, um, gathering information from the node, and the controller is responsible for managing the satellites within the nodes. And each part of the link store is independent from each other, so there will be no downtime if you reboot, upgrade, or just shut down the link store controller or the satellite. And satellites and controllers are stateless, and this gives us a plenty of uh, space in our uh, these IT designs. Obviously, to implement LinStore to any ecosystem, we have a, a great API and drivers for such systems, and our team of expertise and developers are continuously maintaining those and keeping up the current versions always updated. And here is the summary of LinStore ecosystem. And on the bottom, we have a hardware level it could be HTTs, SSDs, or new tags like, let's say, NVMEs or PMEMs that you, you want to manage. One step up is the volume management part, which can be the LVM or ZFS or nothing, maybe. And there here comes the block storage part, which can be a DRBD or something else. Uh, if you choose the RBD, that means you can replicate your volumes to other machines, other virtual machines, physical machines, physical storages, I don't know, within the kernel level. And then we are using some transport protocols like ICCASI, NVMe over fabric, and, or the RBD diskless uh, for attaching these disks to the orchestrators. And um, Instore is managing this whole stack in the controller with with some simple CLI commands 
and it gives you some easy, solid, and robust software for your disk automations in the block storage area. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much it. So here comes the best part of this slide deck. Um, I, I want to explain a lot of uh, Lean Store, but uh, we are running out of time, so I, I'm, I'm keeping um, um, I'm keeping it uh, small. So here comes the best part of this slide deck, which is uh, why Lean Store is a good fit for Soda um, integration. So uh, Soda is an open uh, single framework connecting uh, these separate solutions into seamless and end-to-end -end solutions. And my colleagues in this Soda Foundation explained to you in the earlier sessions, and thank you for that. And I have been invited to uh, Tokyo Soda Summit on December, actually. And since then, I'm really uh, excited about the whole project. Um, Soda Data Framework is everyone's dream in the IT because people don't like stacking in one solution or vendor or ecosystem uh, or, or storage, something. And Link Store is an open source software defined storage that can work on any hardware, any platform, or any ecosystem. And thanks to this flexibility, we believe Link Store will give Soda a serious momentum on block storage automation and management. And we believe this is a really good fit on Soda's uh, philosophy. With Link Store integration, you can easily combine and uh, manage uh, maybe your cloud on-premise or hybrid workloads in your infrastructure and thank you for listening to me um i give the microphone to the next speaker thanks yusuf uh, and all the speakers uh, that came before me is a great introduction to the various projects that are happening on uh, Soda. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this virtual event, and I hope uh, the next few minutes the internet cords will be in my favor. I'm uh, joining in from India, just like Sadil. Uh, about me, I'm uh, Kiran Mova. I'm the co founder and chief architect at MyData. MyData is focused on building products and solutions that help infrastructure. Uh, and platform engineers build data management platforms. And specifically, we are focused on Kubernetes, uh, uh, using Kubernetes itself to build the uh, data management platforms. To uh, that effect, uh, we have uh, several uh, products and solutions that were built. A couple of them are part of the uh, CNCF, uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, OpenEPS and Litmus. Today, I'll be speaking more about uh, OpenEPS. Uh, and just to kind of introduce Litmus, it just became a Sandbox project in uh, just this week, uh, or like you know maybe like yeah the beginning of this week. Uh, it helps you uh, build uh, chaos engineering into your CI/CD pipelines, especially if you are like pushing your code into Kubernetes. Uh, it's a completely Kubernetes native thing. Um, so uh, to uh, speak about Soda, I'm actually really honored to be a DSC member uh, of the Soda Foundation. Uh, the mission and the values that the Soda Foundation brings are something that are close to my data as well as personally to me. Um, so uh, the foundation's uh, mission, uh, as it is, uh, as much as it is about, uh, let's say, like building an open uh, source. Uh, framework, architecture, reference implementations. It's also about building a really uh, strong open source community. And I'm pretty sure like we can pull this off because most of the people that are that have spoken already and also the members that are not on the call today are uh, experienced in building open source communities as part of Apache or like even open, uh, uh, Linux Foundation via CNCF. So, um, just introduce myself there, and uh, we'll be talking mostly about uh, eco projects. Uh, so, uh, we heard a lot about the um, uh, core and the native projects, uh, but you know, this definitely is some transformative change that's happening in the data management platform. And there are so many different ways in which you can build that stack, and uh, the you know, packages that you use. They're already part of, let's say, like uh, CNCF, uh, which is kind of primarily leading the Kubernetes efforts and all the uh, container-related projects. 
Um, but as you'll see in this presentation, uh, that's not sufficient to build and fully feature a data management platform. Um, but you have to work with those projects as well. Uh, so OpenAPS is one such project in CNCF, and uh, Kubernetes obviously is like the driver for many of these. Uh, we'll see how that uh, synergy is kind of getting built. Uh, just to recap, like, why do we really need to rethink uh, the um, data management platforms? Uh, this, uh, you know, I, some of us actually have been around uh, when three tier architectures were the coolest thing to happen. Um, and SAN was like, you know, pretty hot. Um, but since then, uh, the cloud native companies or cloud uh, companies that uh, started with zero infrastructure of their own started uh, coming up. And we see an enormous growth in terms of the scale at which these applications have to perform and the amount of data that they have to store, as well as there's been so much of innovation that has happened in the storage media itself. Uh, we, we speak about NVMF uh, in, as a fabric for transporting storage. Um, and it's, uh, as Kasi has been around for a long time, but you know, uh, we, we are also talking about uh, um, SPTK, DPTK, where you can actually run your storage controllers in the user space right now uh, uh, to kind of get much more performance and uh, agility. Uh, so the agility part is uh, the key aspect. I think the storage um, industry or like the architectures have uh, kind of evolved, but in terms of how the software itself has built, uh, that has not changed much. Uh, the applications have changed uh, in terms of like shifting towards microservices, being more distributed in nature, and they're kind of becoming more feature rich, more innovative, and also the speed at which they get delivered is insane, right? But when it comes to uh, the storages, I think um, we are still seeing like, you know, uh, long release cycles and all that. Um, at the core of this is really open source and Kubernetes that's powering the applications to get re-architected. But one might ask, like, you know, is Kubernetes right for data uh, or like, you know, stateful applications? Uh, it used to be the case uh, that uh, Kubernetes was built for stateless applications. But uh, if you look at the recent enhancements and the kind of applications that are running in uh, Kubernetes, you will be surprised at how many databases actually run in Kubernetes now. Even in fact, like if people who are using Kubernetes and say that they're only running stateless applications, if you probe a little bit and ask them about, are you running your um, CI CD or like say observability, uh, they end up saying that, yes, we are running in Kubernetes, you know, Prometheus, Cortex, and these things have really become popular. And those are stateful applications that are running within Kubernetes. The shift that we are seeing now is also powered by the advancements that Kubernetes itself has done in the storage uh, area, CSI being the major one. Um, while CSI has enabled um, outside storages to get connected to Kubernetes, I'm a little hesitant to call them as completely um, container native. Uh, the Storages were actually purpose built for running with uh, VMs and uh, bare metals or like, you know, with servers. And we kind of saw a few uh, use cases early on where um, with Kubernetes, the amount of compute power you have is so much that not a single SAN can really support it. And you need like some way of ubiquitous uh, storage layer. Uh, so connecting um, different CSI drivers with the SAN will end up creating silos within your uh, Kubernetes clusters, and you can't easily move them across different uh, clusters, or even within the clusters, you can't scale up and down like the way you really want to do it, right? Uh, so this is where like, you know, instead of calling that as a container native storage, um, the term that, uh, you know, in my opinion would be good is a container attached storage. Uh, the history for this container attached storage, uh, it's uh, uh, kind of started when we were thinking about like, you know, the open EBS, which uh, we try to architect for Kubernetes native environments. It's actually an hyper uh, storage that runs within Kubernetes. Um, so we started seeing a lot of users come up and say that they really want to 
write applications where they don't need replication and distribution capabilities from storage. They really want like storage, which is local. So uh, then you go to day two operations and all that. Maybe yeah, I need replication for high availability, or maybe like I want to uh, uh, do a backup to the remote store, uh, but not on a regular basis. The application is capable of taking care of a lot of these storage uh, features that were traditionally coming from SAN. So we needed an architecture which was somewhere in between DAS, direct attack storage, and what was in the SAN. And that's what we call it as container native storage, uh, container attached storage. So container attached storage, um, a few things to uh, think about is uh, what's the release cycle like, or like, you know, what are the, what's the time taken to uh, perform some of the day two operations? If it's months or like, you know, even weeks, then you're really not in the container attached storage or even in the Kubernetes uh, uh, ecosystem or like you're not reaping the benefits of Kubernetes. Um, any kind of operation that you do within Kubernetes has to almost be instantaneous. And GitOps is kind of catching up and with Soda, and projects like OpenEBS, we are trying to bring that kind of agility to the data management uh, platforms. If you want to learn more about uh, container attached storage, there are a few blogs that are published on the CNCF. Uh, you can kind of uh, look at them. Uh, the key aspects that I would take away uh, about container attached storage is these are storage uh, controllers that are built with microservices patterns. They are delivered as containers and they're orchestrated by Kubernetes itself. A lot of uh, open source and commercial options are available uh, for the container right out storage uh, category uh, as, as of today. And the other other thing that kind of uh, defines them is they have a declarative API, uh, uh, which is the cornerstone of Kubernetes. So a uh, few benefits for using uh, the uh, microservices based uh, container attached storage kind of an architecture. Of course, you it, it's all open source Apache licensed and um, you kind of don't have to get logged into the uh, uh, on-premise or the cloud service uh, vendors that uh, provide the storage. You can kind of use the data mobility features, let's say like with Soda to kind of take that uh, uh, workloads along with the storage to some other uh, platforms. It uh, reduces cost um, from a business point of view, not just in terms of um, you know giving you the option to move, but also uh, ability to um, reduce the operational cost because most of the APIs are Kubernetes based, and if your in operational engineers know how to run Kubernetes, they also know how to run these uh, new kind of uh, storage engines. Uh, th there are a lot of um, commercial products also available using these open source technologies uh, for example like uh, uh, a convoy from a mesos or like the locomotive comes into play and open also has launched a new product called uh, kubera uh, which is on the same lines um, so uh, in terms of uh, the use case i want to present a slightly different one than what we were talking about uh, so far uh, so this is what i uh, kind of got from talking to a person who is trying to architect a solution uh, for uh, olap and he's a currently a uh, oracle user and uh, typically he has like a 100 tb volume that is provisioned but now when he's going into the kubernetes uh, he wants to split that OLAP server into 100 different pods with each pod getting a 1 TB volume. So you're basically uh, uh, distributing the data of per user into a pod associated with its own volume. And a set of um, metadata servers that can route the data in a high availability, which are kind of uh, stateless. So this allows the uh, uh, architecture to um, scale up and down. Uh, scaling up, though it is uh, difficult, it's uh, kind of doable with uh, the uh, traditional approaches. Um, you know, maybe with this solution, it can be much faster because you can kind of hook into the Kubernetes auto scaling uh, logic. Scaling down was always a challenge with uh, the older solutions. Let's say you start with a 100 TB volume, you can never go down unless you actually schedule like downtime and maintenance and all those kind of stuff. But with this architecture, that's based on microservices and Kubernetes, you can get that benefit. Also, using these approaches, you can easily plug in like the GDR um, uh, 
the compliance related uh, um, requirements that you get uh, like gdpr into the architecture very easily so uh, if you want to build such an architecture you actually have three pillars uh, so one of the pillars is about the uh, cluster life cycle. Kubernetes does not just start by itself. So you need somebody to kind of put together the required storage, compute, and network and build the nodes and give it to a Kubernetes cluster. And once you have a Kubernetes cluster, it's about running the stateful applications in an automated way within the Kubernetes cluster without having a lot of dependency on how the nodes are built. There has to be a complete um, uh, isolation in terms of responsibility in that aspect. Uh, while these two things are something that's already happening today, um, there are a lot of day uh, two uh, operations that will come up as more and more stateful workloads come into Kubernetes that require a data lifecycle kind of an operations that need to happen on these op architectures. So that's where Soda Foundation comes in uh, with uh, a unified way of helping the uh, life cycle for creating the volumes from different types of storages as well as um, helping support like the uh, data mobility kind of use cases so um, there are various projects that are uh, underway uh, uh, for each of these pillars in um, uh, sort of foundation i'm actually kind of helping with the csi plug and play uh, in fact if your storage today supports csi driver and let's say you have implemented the volume attachment interfaces uh, uh, via the kubernetes crs that uh, are exposed um, then we can take your storage and attach it to the kubernetes nodes uh, we have an api that uh, is currently in the prototype that we can kind of test it out with your uh, uh, CSI drivers. Uh, just hit us on um, Slack if you want to get your storage integrated and run in a Kubernetes native way, uh, like you know, uh, taking the benefits of the agility that Kubernetes promises. Uh, we would like to hear from you. Uh, thanks for the time, and I will hand it off to Stefano to talk about Zenko from Skeleti. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can get the slides to number 68. Um, can you guys see the, the, which slides we're on? Because I'm lagging behind. In any case, I'll start talking. Um, and we can, we can ignore the slides. I'm Stefano Mafuli. I work at Scality, a company that builds a market-leading software-defined file and object storage platform. And uh, we've been working in the past four years on Zenko, which is a project that provides a single API endpoint to store data in any storage location and can uh, uh, also offer a global metadata namespace, policy-based metadata management, and it's a fully open source project. So for the sake of time, and despite the fact that I have a huge echo in my uh, as feedback, um, I will um, I will scroll rapidly through through the deck. Uh, maybe if someone scrolls through with me, uh, so that we talk a little bit about Zencoid. One of the major features and and, and uh, main reason for why. Scality started investing about three, four years ago um, on this uh, on this project is because we wanted to have customers have the possibility to move their data in multiple clouds in, and between on-premises storage and off-premises storage. And Zenko designed to, to cover a lot of uh, use cases from uh, disaster recovery, NHA, uh, high availability for data, uh, cloud media workflows and uh, things like um, 
synchronization and movement of data between edge and, and core um, or edge and cloud. So um, the, the, the software is, um, um, I'd say let's skip to the, the, the where we, we talk a little bit about the technology given the audience and we and I'll give you a, a high level view of the architecture uh, since um, since it's a uh, it's most most uh, most interesting, one of the 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 reason for 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 Zenko is to offer uh, best of breed technology that provides no give you gives you no akin as a user and uh, gives um, intelligent uh, way of uh, managing data uh, across different clouds uh, and different destinations. Plus it. Um, through Zenko, you have a unified interface across all of these clouds, and you can search um, data across all of them in one through one um, endpoint. Um, and we we also been working on a policy based uh, data management engine that allows you to move data uh, in uh, different locations based on uh, um, based on uh, um, the capabilities or the characteristics of those files. It can be deployed anywhere on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we also, as Kerity, we maintain a project for um, bare metal uh, Kubernetes called Metal Kates, Metal KATS, um, which is something that is, you know, it's available and it's worth uh, looking at if you're into metal uh, running Kubernetes on bare metal. At the high level, um, the Kubernetes deployment comes with uh, with um, uh, monitoring through Prometheus, and uh, Zenko offers uh, two uh, one API endpoint with two different uh, compatibilities uh, with um, Amazon S3 and Amazon and Azure uh, Blob. So you can write data into into the system uh, using using applications supporting either of those APIs. And then, uh, um, and this is um, these interfaces are offered through uh, one of the components that is also open source at Tango called Cloud Server. And then uh, the shuffling of data is done through a workflow engine called Backbeat. And uh, uh, Mongo uh, DB keeps the metadata for the for the for the objects, and um, and uh, manages also the the destination uh, that can be Azure. Amazon, um, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and and others, including file systems. So the the interesting feature that we have released uh, a few couple of weeks ago in uh, Zenko 1.2 has been uh, the fact that you can also um, ingest the data inside out of band. We call the out of band communication. So you can connect data directly uh, storage locations to to Zenko. And Zenko, without moving the data, will ingest uh, the metadata from it, uh, in, in, from existing S3 buckets. But also, uh, the, the new feature is that you can ingest also from um, existing NFS mount points. So, crossing the, the boundaries between objects and files. Um, and so, this, this allows you to, to connect your NAS, for example, to a, to a Zenko cluster and, and let Zenko learn what kind of data you have and just the metadata. So you have uh, immediately a metadata search across all of your destinations, including the NAS, and you can do policy-based um, um, data management. So you can set up uh, workflows like one-to-one -one replication. So everything that is inside this folder owned by this user replicated into S3, for example, or one-to-many, multiple destination, you can do other other things, life cycle expiration between files and objects, and it's a super um, super interesting uh, feature, super interesting capabilities. So, um, without taking more time from the conversation, I'll share the slides afterwards for those who are interested. the The future for us um, is. Is bright. Uh, we do want to get more capabilities inside inside Zenko. We do want to um, enable ingest data ingestion, the metadata ingestion, also for uh, Samba shares and SMB file systems, um, Google uh, Cloud the platform, obviously, and other object storage platform. With, um, since 
things like uh, Backblaze, for example, started to um, support TS3 APIs. So that's another project that we started looking at. And um, we're also working into expanding the capabilities of the data workflow system um, and add uh, function-based uh, capabilities. Right? Basically, given um, enable something like Lambda um, functions inside the Zenko platform so that you can run uh, more complex uh, scenarios and more complex uh, workflows. And we're looking at sort of foundation also for the for standardization of our APIs towards the data management APIs that uh, Soda is looking at. And obviously we're looking at the conversations for, for the incubation uh, into, into the Sona Foundation. So um, the, if you want to get involved with uh, Zenko, the project is open source and I'll share the links uh, in the chat with, um, uh, for, for the GitHub projects and, uh, the, and the website. And with that, I pass to next, I think is Larry. Hello. <clears throat> hi, can you hear me? Uh, hi, this uh, thanks, Stefano. Uh, this is Larry Lai. I'm uh, the uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, open source, uh, uh, you know, Soda uh, uh, outreach community. Uh, so, if you uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so you probably seen this slide before from Reddy's talk. Uh, so Soda Foundation is a open source project aimed to force an ecosystem of uh, open source data storage software for data uh, data uh, auto autonomy. And so um, ecosystem is, is super important uh, for this project. Um, we uh, try to provide a kind of open and uh, collaborative and neutral uh, kind of environment for all the uh, community member to work together to, to build the, uh, the platform, build, build up the ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's the uh, organization uh, chart for SODA. Uh, so outreach community is, is in this, uh, all the green boxes. Uh, so our mission is to uh, evangelize, try to uh, reach out to, uh, you know, uh, to industry, uh, to uh, various uh, open source, other open source project, and, and try to uh, kind of uh, uh, expand and grow our community. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, let's, see, let's go to the next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have uh, various uh, regional uh, committee in, uh, around the world. So in uh, North America, we in Japan, China, India, and Europe as well. Um, so, you know, we have a regional activities. So we try to grow a local uh, kind of a community, but also we also try to uh, start other efforts like uh, ambassador program, uh, try to uh, uh, engage other, uh, you know, uh, open source uh, community members, try to help us to uh, uh, expand, uh, spread the words, and try to help us to promote Soda brand, Soda uh, project. Uh, so we have um, a global uh, community uh, that uh, you know it's, it's been around for like uh, two, three years. Start with Open SDS project, uh, but we have uh, been pretty active around the world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, engage many, uh, participate in many events, but we also have regular kind of meetups uh, within different regions. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so there's, there's a few slides we'll probably go through very quick. Uh, but uh, so we have a, um, so we have uh, organized a various events uh, in the past year uh, also. Uh, so uh, we did a soft launch of Soda in Tokyo in December, back in December last year, and uh, we um, and then we also have uh, held various events in China and India, uh, like meetups, uh, you know, open source uh, 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 events as well. Uh, let's for the time uh, sake of time, let's go to. Uh, Page uh, slide 90, please. 
you know, here's a uh, picture of uh, events in, in the US. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one, one before that. Okay, so I, I want to just uh, quickly ex explain, uh, you know, the the what is um, how you can uh, if you're interested in this in Soda, how can you join? So um, in terms of uh, you know, so so we are focusing on real world use user case use cases, and, and so we are trying to. Um, uh, work the project is all about working on a, a solution complete solution and, and we also uh, you know uh, provide an environment that uh, users uh, and uh, members can uh, influence uh, and, and the roadmap influence the project uh, and also provide a uh, networking environment um, and, and also uh, this is a great platform allow collaboration so so this is the uh, kind of the reason why many organizations have joined soda uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, so we have like typically we have two uh, mainly have two types of uh, members. Uh, some of the uh, end user uh, like Toyota, like uh, Yahoo Japan, uh, China Unicom. Uh, those are large end user. So, so uh, for them, uh, benefits is they can uh, you know participate in EUAC, which is end user advisor committee. And they can also nominate uh, uh, someone. Uh, like if they're a premier member, they can send a representative to the uh, governing board, uh, and, and then also can be part of the TSC uh, Technical Steering Committee. And we have a monthly uh, kind of meeting uh, for different uh, uh, groups, and we also have uh, have you know discussion about uh, the needs and, and requirements. Uh, for end users, um, and, and the other benefits. Uh, sorry. So, so next. Uh, so, other type of uh, uh, members are vendors, and for vendors, uh, they also, uh, you know, they be they can be part of these uh, TLC TSC uh, uh, technical steering committee. They can also participate. You know, in in uh, looking at uh, look. Uh, gaining insight into the uh, strategy uh, and be able to um, uh, influence the uh, direction and roadmap uh, of the uh, uh, technical development. Uh, next slide. So, so there are typically two types. So, this is like a Linux Foundation project. It's, it's funded by members. So, there are two types of paid members. There's one that's a premier members, there's another general member. Uh, they will also have uh, supporters. Um, so different main difference between premier member and general member is the uh, uh, they will uh, as a premier member they will get a, a board seat uh, automatically uh, once they become a premier premier member. Uh, so so there's a list of events we plan to do uh, for for rest of this year. Uh, so you know because of the pandemic situation. Uh, some of the uh, uh, events they may change; they may become virtual. Uh, um, so it's it's right now this is the current plan, but we'll see what happens. Um, so so in the future, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can. Um, uh, if you if you're interested in this, you can also you know we're welcome to participate in some of the events we plan to uh, uh, engage, plan to participate the rest of this year. Next slide, please. Oh, so that's that's the end of it. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for for uh, uh, join our mini summit today. And uh, you can look up stuff. if you need more information. You can always look on our website or look uh, uh, check the GitHub uh, Soda Foundation, and you can find more information. Uh, so that's the end of my slide. Uh, I think we. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, I want to uh, thank you again for uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, so we should. I, I hope that you had a chance to learn a little here uh, about Op Soda and learn a little bit about what we're trying to do, or what is Soda is about. And uh, so now maybe we can have all the speakers on on the screen and they can answer some questions. <laughs>